Time-lapse photography is creating movies from hundreds or maybe even thousands of still photos that were taken at a specific timed interval. Because YouTube has hundreds of videos already on time-lapse photography, this Dig Deeper focuses on its use at Jamestown and its particular value in archaeology. So the first question is why? It is aesthetically pleasing to watch light move and change as it goes across the subject. In archaeology, however, time-lapse photography is a critical part of our record. It displays excavation progress as a function of time. It also allows us to communicate with the public as to how our efforts were done. And finally, it permits days or even weeks of work to be seen in just a few minutes. So the next question is, how do you do it? Equipment-wise, you need a camera. It could be a DSLR, it could be a GoPro, it could be a point-and-shoot. Even uh, cell phones these days have time-lapse software embedded. Each has their strength and weakness. DSLRs will give you a very high-resolution image, but they have a basic limitation. And that is that many DSLRs, the mechanical shutter is designed to break between 100 and 400,000 shutter clicks. Well, with time-lapse photography, it's not uncommon to shoot two to 5,000 shots a week, and so you can really break your camera fairly quickly. So in my case, I'm using a DSLR with an electronic shutter that will shoot a lot longer, and I can do a lot of time-lapse with it. GoPros are very useful as well. They have the software built in. They're waterproof. And there are two basic GoPros that I've worked with, the Hero 3 and the Hero 5. The Hero 3 shoots a 12 megapixel image, and it has the value of when it's plugged in, the wireless will literally stay on forever, which is great if you tuck away the camera in a high or hard place to get to. The GoPro 5 has a much higher resolution, but unfortunately the wireless will shut off as soon as you turn it off, even if it's plugged in. And so in the video you're watching, I literally had to climb up and turn on the camera every morning to get it to work. I haven't had a lot of experience with uh, cell phones and uh, 360 cameras, so I'm not going to comment on that. So the next issue then is triggering the camera. And that's either done internally with camera software, and right now you're looking at a picture of one of the screens on my camera that shows me that I can set how many shots am I going to take and how long between shots will it be. If your camera does not have the software internally, it's possible to buy an external intervalometer, and they're not very expensive, and it does the same thing. It plugs into the camera and triggers it at defined intervals for your time-lapse photography. The last piece of equipment you'll need is a tripod to hold your camera steady while collecting images. In an advanced level, you can also consider adding rotation, as I use a camera lapse, which isn't too expensive, or you can actually attach a GoPro mount to the hood of your car. Mine lasted about five years before it fell off, so it's fairly robust. This allows you to take time-lapse videos of road tours. Finally, for a few hundred dollars, you can also purchase a slider that moves the camera either across the scene or up or down of a slight elevation. If your time-lapse will include a sunset or moonrise, planning is very important. I have found that the Photographer's Ephemeris software is extremely helpful. It's based on a Google Earth platform, and once you set a location and date, the software will show you where the sun is throughout the entire day with a gold line, and it'll show you where the moonrise is with a light blue line and a moonset with a dark blue line. Don't forget to bring a compass as well. Okay, so it's time to go. Let's set up the camera. First you focus on, the on a target and then you set the focus to manual. This keeps the camera focus from shifting during your time lapse, which is a very unappealing visual appearance. Similarly, the ISO for the camera should be set on manual so it doesn't change, and the f-stop should be set to a single value, as should the white balance. The overall message is try and keep things the same. Shooting format, I usually use JPEG just because of the large number of photos you're going to take. Okay, so now it's a question of how long of time is there between each photo. Keep in mind that most videos are showed at about 24 frames per second. So you want to choose a time interval that makes the action look smooth. In the time lapse earlier of people in Tyvek suits doing excavation or exhumation of the presumptive Yardley grave, 
The time interval was about one shot every 60 seconds because the archaeologists were moving fairly slowly and very cautiously. In the video of uh, excavation of the church tower, the time interval was 10 seconds between photos because the troweling action was a lot more vigorous and fast. Other issues you need to consider, how many photos can you put on your SD card, and does your intervalometer have a certain limitation? In my camera, it only allows me to shoot a thousand shots. So if I know my battery lasts five hours and I'm shooting into the night, I make a calculation of what my interval will be to get a thousand shots in the five hour battery life. So the last decision you have to make is what should the shutter speed be? The most common approach is to let the camera decide using aperture control. In this video of the backfilling of the 1608 church, you can see a constant exposure is achieved over a wide variety of light intensity. That's what aperture control is all about. The other approach is to manually set the value, and this is a lot more difficult because you need to know what the exposure should be two or three hours after you start, which is once again a challenge. However, as you can see, this is a very striking appearance that can be achieved in this way in appropriate settings. So the last step in the process is post-processing the photos. Um, there are times where I will actually take the large number of photos and individually process them using Adobe Camera Raw. This allows me to sharpen them and change color so it's more pleasing on an individual image basis before the images are compiled. The compiled images can be put together as a movie with several different ways. You can go with freeware such as Time Lapse Assembler, GoPro Studio, iMovie. Most recently I've been using Adobe Premiere simply because it seems to handle the files well and some of the file sizes up to 32,000 shots can be quite large. That said, thank you so much for watching this episode of Dig Deeper.